Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome on this rather blustery day. I was um, listening and kind of coming to there on my way over here. If you know that, who's there? It's a rather blustery day on this um, Wednesday, uh, windy day. And it is a Wednesday, windy Wednesday. So thank you so much for coming out on uh, this, with this blustery weather to join our um, event for this afternoon. And when Pooh was on his way on the blustery day, he was going to a thoughtful spot. Um, and so I hope, and I trust, and I know that we too have arrived at a thoughtful spot um, today as we um, enter into this event. I'm Teresa ladrigan Welkley. I'm the VP for Mission here at Salve, and it's, it's really my uh, privilege to welcome all of you to the Mercy Interdisciplinary Faculty Collaborative on the critical concern of women and gender. And among all the hats that I have the um, gift to wear in my work here at Salve, this is among my most very favorite um, community, this faculty collaborative, the faculty collaboratives around the critical concerns and this one um, in particular. And for those of you who might not be familiar, the Macaulay Institute for Mercy Education, it's a you know, newer initiative at Salve, seeks to advance the vocation of the university through the development of interdisciplinary research, teaching, and leadership initiatives that foster an ethic of dialogue, reflection, and action around the tradition of mercy and the critical concerns of mercy, and contribute to the development of Mercy Catholic higher education in the 21st century. And we currently have two faculty collaboratives that are underway in the Institute, and one is focused on the critical concern of women and gender, and that we'll hear from today shortly, and the other that is focused on the critical concern of immigration. I'm just looking to see if some of the folks from that collaborative are here as well. We convened this morning. And over the past four years, we've also hosted faculty collaboratives around the concerns of race and earth. And I see some of the um, collaborators in um, our company here as well. And we're really grateful to the McKillop Library for um, hosting this as part of the faculty lecture series, as we have done for um, those collaboratives as well. Um, in Evangelii Gaudium, Pope Francis's apostolic exhortation on the joy of the gospel, he writes, demands that the legitimate rights of women be respected based on the firm conviction that all are equal in dignity, present the church with profound and challenging questions which cannot be lightly evaded. So you may have come today with profound and challenging questions um, related to uh, the critical concerns of women and gender that cannot be lightly evaded. And this Mercy Interdisciplinary Faculty Collaborative has regularly convened over the past two years to wrestle with these challenging questions and in the foundation of this, the conviction that all persons have equal, are equal in dignity and rights. So here on the screen are a few of the salient questions that our Macaulay scholars have engaged and explored through our work together. And you may resonate with some of these questions and bring your own. So in this afternoon's program, we'll have the opportunity to engage several of these questions in the work of our Macaulay scholars. And by way of background, each of the scholars here received a small grant to support a research or teaching initiative or university initiative that advances work on the critical concern of women and gender as a part of this collaborative. And um, all of the faculty that are present here today utilize a portion of this grant to um, partner with student research uh, collaborators as well. And many of them are here with us, so we welcome you in a particular way. And so over the two years of this collaborative, our scholars and student researchers have convened seven times um, in the year. So there's seven collaborators here, and we have we had seven seminars um, each year over two years, engaging with one of the members' projects in each seminar. And we're really excited today to convene with all of you to share out and to celebrate the fruits of this work, this collaborative work. Um, due to the limitations of time, um, you will have brief kind of tastes of this work um, as we proceed. Each uh, scholar will present for about five minutes and then to be able to offer a sense of the engagement through the collaborative, we'll also have a response um, from a colleague um, in the collaborative. So we'll get started. We'll first hear from 
these first four collaboratives here, um, I think on your left, Katie, Tara, Victoria, and um, Esther. And then we'll pause for questions and engagement with um, all of us. And then we'll move on to um, Donna and Katie and Belinda. And then we'll return once again for like en engagement questions dialogue with all of us. And thank you to Don who will be facilitating um, this conversation for all of us today. So the first Macaulay scholars that you will hear from are um, Katie Gabriel Black, she's associate professor in the psychology department, and she'll be discussing her initiative on shifting roles, shifting identities, ex-evangelical mothers' experiences of parenthood and identity development. And next, Tara Brooke Watkins, assistant professor in music, theater, and dance, will offer a brief response to Katie's work and then share out in her own initiative on the Schoenberg experiment. Victoria Gonzalez, Dr. Victoria Gonzalez, Assistant Professor of Sociology in the Department of Cultural, Environmental, and Global Studies, will respond to Tara and share out on her project, Examining Gender Roles. And to wrap up our first exchange, Dr. Esther Alaracón, Associate Professor in Spanish in the Department of Modern Languages, will respond to Victoria and share out on her project, Las Chicas Son Vieras, Mujeres y Música, with Katie Gabriel Black offering a response. So please join me in welcoming all of our scholars, and let's get started. Hi, thank you for coming today. Um, so my project is part of a larger, the project I'm going to talk about today is a piece of a larger study that I called the Ex-Evangelical Parenting Study. Um, it was originally supported by a small grant from the American Psychological Association from their Division 36, which is the religion division. And I was interested at the time uh, in how people who were getting pushed out of evangelical Christianity or leaving were also transitioning to parenthood, were thinking about how they were going to teach their kids about gender and sexuality and race and God and the Bible and hell and all those things that they learned growing up to their child. And so during the pandemic, when everyone had nothing else to do except to talk to me, I interviewed the new parents about this transition to parenthood and how they were thinking about these things. Um, we know that becoming a new parent is really hard, but when you've lost the framework for the values that you're going to teach your kid, potentially, it, it's, it's that much harder. So for this collaborative, I chose to focus on a small piece of the data that I gathered. and. What stood out to me as I was interviewing these women, among other things, was that many of them identified as not straight. And these women were in, for the most part, happy marriages with men. Many of them had gotten married really young. Um, but as they were thinking about, oh, I'm not an evangelical Christian anymore, what am I? They were also reevaluating who they were with respect to sexual orientation. Um, about half of my participants and from the overall, there are 21 participants total, and about 10 of them identified as not straight. So queer, lesbian, bi, asexual. I was like, what is, why are there so many of them? Like, what's going on there? Um, so my research questions were, you know, what teachings about sexuality and gender did participants internalize growing up in a really conservative evangelical context? Um, how has growing up in a conservative evangelical environment shaped their experiences around disclosure of these identity shifts? Like, who are they talking to about this stuff and why? And then in what ways has this shift in sexual identification influenced parenting strategies, or what they think their parenting strategies are gonna be because many of them have infants. So I've had some really wonderful students work with me this year, Samantha, Mary, Annalise, I'm not sure if any of them are here, and I'm really appreciative to them for their support in transcribing and coding these interviews. So because of how many white evangelical Christians interpret biblical passages around gender and sexuality, and of the programming that's out there for kids and teens, particularly in the 90s and 2000s when my participants were growing up. It was abstinence only, true love waits. The expectation is to save yourself for marriage. There's some pretty rigid expectations for what gender was supposed to be, and most of my participants were raised under a pretty strict framework for how to discipline children. So spare the rod, spoil the child, the voice of James Dobson in their ear. Um, there was an environment of fear, fear of going to hell for saying or doing the wrong thing, for not believing the right way, for being gay. And so what this means is there's a whole generation of people who didn't figure things out. They got married really young. Um, 
they started to have kids, and then they realized they had not really explored who they were at all. They just never had that opportunity. And so this shift was happening as they were becoming parents, which was another major identity shift and causing them to reevaluate what they thought about themselves and about God and how they were gonna relate to their child and partner. Um, I have heard so many stories about the shame participants were experiencing, about their feelings of invisibility during adolescence and emerging adulthood, and about their decisions to disclose or not disclose. Um, many of them lost friends and even connections with family members because of these disclosures or because they pushed back against church doctrine in some way. So their stories were laced with yeah, laced with heartbreak, but also with a lot of hope, too, like hope for a better experience for their own kids. Um, all of them plan to expose their kid to diversity really, really early, to enforce that their kid was loved and accepted as whoever they were, not kind of despite it, and to model openness and curiosity. Um, every single one of them um, rejected an abstinence-only framework for sexuality in favor of teaching their kids consent and healthy boundaries, and some expressed that they wanted to figure it out with their kid, like we'll be co-learning these new things together. Um, so I'm gonna stop here with a quote from a participant. I had asked her if she had any advice for a new parent transitioning out of evangelical Christianity. And she said, if I were giving someone advice, it would be to learn to trust your body, and your gut, or your intuition, or whatever the best word is. I think faith in Christianity explicitly took that from me and made me not trust myself. Like, I didn't trust my body and soul in every possible way. And I think that's what I would want for someone who's either younger than me or in an earlier phase than I am. You know, like, look, you can trust your body and what you know. Thank you, Katie. Um, I think part of what you will experience today is a lot of what we experienced in our collaborative, which was hearing responses from each of us about the work. Um, and Teresa just paired us up so well, I think, in some of this. So um, Katie, every time you presented in our collaborative, and even right now, I have these moments of like, ooh, flashbacks from childhood, growing up as an evangelical in Oklahoma. Um, you, you named James Dobson, and I remember walking into my bedroom when I was 12, and a book by James Dobson was sitting on my bed with a note from my father, right? Like, we never had the sex talk, but that was it. It was use this book to explain what sex is and what sexuality is and what it means to be a woman. Thank you, James. Um, so every time you would speak in the meetings, I just felt, like, even from across the table, like, soul connection. And we haven't even had conversations about, you know, our, our backgrounds and our upbringings. But I wonder, like, I constantly found myself wondering, how did your upbringing um, inspire you to do this work and impact the work? I mean, I think in every single way, right? Like, this project came out of having conversations with friends. I don't have kids, but it was coming from conversations with friends who were having kids. and. Like, what the heck are you going to do? Like, what are you going to teach them about this stuff? Um, there's, I'm, this, this project is a qualitative project, and so I have the luxury of saying, it's okay that I'm bringing this, what might be called bias to the table here, under qualitative frameworks. Um, I'm acknowledging it. Um, it's certainly shaped the questions that I've asked participants. It's impacted how I was able to recruit, like using language like, I graduated from Houghton College, and now I work at some, like, people know what those words mean when you're in the conservative Christian circles. Um, it has impacted the types of conversation I was able to have with participants, like, you just kind of know. Um, oh, you grew up doing a want. I grew up doing a want too. Oh, let me tell you about my experience. And it was so interesting how similar people's experiences are, despite where they grew up in the country, even internationally, how unified the messages were um, how how we were and they and us were all kind of indoctrinated the same way and yet we've kind of found each other in this really cool way through research and through these Facebook groups online that I found that support people in the same position and, and so I, I'm I'm sort of doing me search because I'm getting words from participants about that maybe I didn't have labels for growing up even though I'm not a parent and that I um, but 
it's helping me figure things out too. And so I, I, I really treasure that part of this project. Time-wise, how are we doing? Okay, thank you, Katie. <laughs> thank you guys very much. So the theater part of me tells me I need to stand. So I'm gonna do that. We're perfectly on time. How about that? So my name is Tara Brooke Watkins. I am your resident theater person. <laughs> who is um, a theater program coordinator in the music, theater, and dance department. Um, I remember when I was thinking about this project a little over two years ago now, um, the only words I had to describe what the heck I was going to do was the Strindberg experiment. I had been researching the playwright August Strindberg for, like, since about 2010. Um, and you know, you kind of start working on dissertation and you put other things aside and it was kind of time for me to come back to that research. Um, so I was coming back to it thinking, I really want to explore a theory that I have not read anybody else writing about yet. And August Strindberg is a Swedish writer uh, who is probably the most pro prolific Swedish writer out there. He's kind of known as the Swedish Shakespeare, if you will. Um, but he writes short stories, he wrote poetry, um, he wrote autobiographies in the third person, and he also wrote plays. And all of his writings are dealing with the power of gender struggles. And so some of what he wrote, things like, I hate women, labeled him as a misogynist. I don't know where we've labeled him historically, but that is what we label him as. And I, every time I read August Strindberg, I just keep thinking, it feels like there's more going on. I know it's easy to just say, because he said I hate women, he must just be a misogynist and we can write him off. And so nobody does his works because he's too complicated. Um, how can we lean into misogyny? But when I read his plays, I see somebody who is struggling not with women, but with something that is happening internally. And he writes short stories, he writes autobiographies, he writes poetry, all about the same exact topics, but his final piece about each topic ends in a play. So something is happening for him as a playwright that he can't work out in these other forms. He also uh, considers himself a scientist, and he considers himself a photographer. Um, but something is happening playwright, with playwriting throughout his life. So when I decided to experiment with Strindberg research, the experiment became a play that we put on here at Salve in the fall of 2022. And we called it the Strindberg Experiment. And I remember starting to think about this and going, well, what is, I don't know what that play is gonna be. Do I just do a Strindberg play and look at how he's struggling with something internally? And what is he struggling with internally? I believe that August Strindberg did not identify as a male, although his body read male, biologically. But in the 19th century, there is no language to describe that. So how does somebody who is struggling and trying to figure out something about their body, even though there's no representation in their body, figure out what that means? I believe he was using theater to do that. I've also worked in children's theater where I've seen children actually start to experiment with costuming that demonstrates a different gender identity than their biological gender. So this was not the first time I had seen it, but I had not yet thought through how a playwright might be doing that. Um, so August Strindberg wrote two plays in 1888, Miss Julie and Creditors, and both of them are structurally so similar that I thought there's no way he's writing this at the exact same time and not uh, comparing these stories in his head. In each play, the main character in Miss Julie is Miss Julie, in Creditors it is Adolf. In each of these two plays, these main characters state that they do not feel like the gender their body is representing. They state this. 
In one play, you can see uh, the, the picture all the way to the left, Adolf actually sculpts a female body with some male genitalia and is trying to work out, there's something in my body, he says this in the play, there's something in my body, it's a woman, and here is what I'm putting out there. Miss Julie, this is a, the picture of Miss Julie up in the, the middle here, um, decides to make a male servant kiss her boot, which is a very powerful move. And as a, as a female, she feels like she needs to have power over this man. And later in the play, she says, I've always felt like a man. Why is no one writing about this in, this in the Strindberg scholarship world? So rather than me just writing about it, I thought, well, why don't we combine these two plays and let's have students who also are willing to name their identities speak from that embodied identity about how they play these characters and how the characters are speaking back to us as audience members. So I, I'm getting a little bit in the weeds because it's so complex. I'm putting words out there that if you have questions about, ask me. We used, for example, moment work to create this play so the, the students would read a piece of the original scripts and say, this stands out to me. Let's play with that in the room. We played with that in the room and that uh, led into creating the actual play. Um, I had four student researchers all together. In the theater world, we call those dramaturgs. Two of them are here. Kim Pike has come back today to be here for us, and Kendra Oberke has joined me this year in completing some of the research. Um, after we did the play, I interviewed each actor about what they discovered about themselves working on the play, how they felt like their gender and sexuality informed how they played the roles, um, and then what they would say uh, to future people who did the show. So one of the things I'm hoping to do for a next step in um, the research is actually work with other people um, in academia, in theater, and see if they will also agree to put on this play and do the exact same experiment. Ask those students who are playing those roles now how their gender and sexuality is informing the reception of Strindberg's works. In the theater world, um, we're pretty good at being kind of in the moment with whatever's happening socially, but sometimes our published plays aren't in that same moment, right? You have to get a play published to catch up. And right now, we, don't ha we have a dearth of plays that are allowing people who don't identify somewhere in a binary gender spectrum to perform. So I also think that what could be really powerful is if this research can get out there, you can take every one of August Strindberg's plays and redo it, thinking about the lens of gender and any gender playing any role, and then asking what that's saying about gender in the 19th century. One of the things our students ended up feeling when we were working on the play was that this was not so much even about what he discovered about gender, but it's about how he felt that the only possibility was that he was, quote, mad or insane. And in the 19th century, if you did cross-dress or even openly identify as a different gender, the result was often prison or being put in a mental institution. Eventually, August Strindberg put himself in a mental institution. So there's a ton of you know, life research that supports this. Um, I'm gonna just quickly show you um, a montage of the play that we created, so you can get just a visual sense of what it looks like. you're seeing are August Strindberg in addition to the characters from the two plays. So we watched his descent into madness, as you will, as he worked on writing the two plays. So that was ultimately what the play became. And I am sure I am 
past time, so you get to respond quickly about how much you loved the play. When you saw it. <laughs> oh my God, Tara, I love the play when I saw it. <laughs> um, uh, thank you, Tara. And completely genuinely, uh, I was struck by the high quality of the play and the type of immersive experience that I had when I saw it. It was incredible. I was wondering, though, about, I feel like one of the things that you just said was that there is a potential to open up Stringbird's plays in a way that is kind of unprecedented, providing opportunities for non-binary individuals and people of all genders. But I'm wondering about sort of the implications for theater in sort of big picture ways, right? Um, so I might not be a theater person, I'm a theater fan. Um, so I know that there, you know, there's right now a non-binary person that's taking over the role of, you know, Audrey uh, in Little Shop of Hearts. I know that, you know, Billy Porter took on the role of the witch um, in... No. No. Oh, let's just keep throwing out plates. Wait, I'm, I'm running out of here. Um, into the woods. There you go. Um, so, you know, there seem to be people creating opportunities for this, but I'm wondering if you think that bigger picture, we can start sort of calling into question the established authentic genders that have been written by the, the you know, the playwrights, or that have been established by the playwrights and saying, why can't we open all of these roles to a more non-binary perspective? I know that there's been a lot of pushback about that, so I'm wondering if you just have any thoughts? I think the power of theater um, is one of those few places we do have that ability to open things up, even in a way that film and TV doesn't, right? And representation matters so much and has such an impact that when you do open, it's called non-traditional casting, right? So if you open up plays to be uh, created in a non-traditional casting way, it lets audience members have to question their own biases. Um, it lets people see themselves, right? It lets people go, oh, like, what if, why am I treating Audrey as, we'll just call her the dumb blonde, because that is her classic stereotyped role in, in um, Little Shop of Horrors. Why do I not think of males that way? Why have, like, it makes you question all of gender. Um, although I'm really struggling with the fact that the two examples, and not, the, not that the examples are wrong, but how, how telling is it that the two examples are a horror <laughs> musical <laughs> and the witch, right? Like, I think we have to also be really conscious of how, how we are choosing to cast people um, who don't identify as a traditional binary gender. I'm gonna stop just because I know time, but thank you. <laughs> How are we doing for time? Good? I could just say one, one sentence. Uh, <laughs> gender is a social construct. <laughs> uh, um, okay, so I'm gonna time myself. I'm gonna, put, I'm gonna give myself four minutes. Let's see how that goes. No, well, I don't need shorts, all right. Um, okay, so what I usually cover before saying that gender is a social construct in my classes is a lot more <laughs> developed, um, but I think what it comes down to and what I'm increasingly interested in is how we are taught how to be gendered in society. So uh, this project took on really two stages, right? Examining gender roles is a fairly broad title, but the way that it started was I was increasingly concerned about a lot of the legislation that was being passed last year that is still being passed. I think the ACLU is still keeping track of almost 400 different uh, bills and laws that could be passed that would regulate things like gender affirming care, uh, that could, would regulate, uh, just they're called in general anti-trans bills and laws, etc. Uh, I was very concerned about this, and I thought that there needed to be a place where we could openly examine our own gender roles and expectations. So last year, the first stage of this project, I sent out a survey to a number of students uh, that responded by navigating uh, vignettes that I had provided them about, very stereotypical gender roles. How do they still apply? How do they not? Uh, and there were a lot of students that really navigated what they were taught 
within their own family structures and then also how they were developing their own gender identities here. And the truth of the matter is that a lot of students are struggling to navigate pronouns, identity, uh, gender presentation on a day-to-day -day basis, but don't necessarily have platforms to address that. So that is what I tried to create with the gender role gallery uh, that we had up in the library last semester. Wait, no, not last semester, in the spring of last year, right? This, it's a blur. I've been here only two years, folks. Um, <laughs> Sometimes it feels longer, sometimes it feels shorter. Uh, and then, so again, in the interest of time, the second project which I have been able to develop that I, can, I, I honestly didn't see myself doing, uh, just to address something that Katie was talking about, the idea of conducting research and having bias. Right now, I am working with a research team that uh, we are all Latin identified, female identified individuals, and we are endeavoring to talk about our own gendered stories and how they have been influenced by both our cultural family backgrounds and also by being in a place where we are, you know, commonly surrounded by a predominantly white population, right? How those stories kind of adjust and the tools and the coping mechanisms that we need to create to navigate that transition. And this comes out of a, a long career of not trying to think about that or study it to now being given the opportunity to have conversations with people uh, about pedagogically how to do this. So, you know, I've made several different, and again, I don't wanna go too far into this, but I've just made a couple of different transitions. We were originally going to interview people about their experiences, asking them questions about what they were taught in terms of their gendered expectations, how, you know, they were taught to be a woman, the messaging that they received about what it meant to be a man in Latin culture, and then the messaging that they would receive here, uh, and how that, that was very different and often contradictory in how these young women had to navigate um, young young individuals, right, female identified women with an ex, uh, etc. Uh, how they, I, I for, even forgot to introduce myself with my pronouns, right? This is bad, sorry, I'm just, I'm, I'm all over the place, my ADHD is kicking in. Um, so basically that they had to navigate their intersectional identities here, and then kind of sit, that's my time, that's four minutes already. Uh, and so they had to kind of sit and navigate the sexism, the racism, the discrimination that they would face on all of those fronts, right? So, but we realized very quickly that interviews were not enough, right? Uh, we transitioned to a pedagogical research method that is called testimonios, right? Where we are teaching and being taught by the people that we are in conversation with. And I say in conversation because the general, um, I guess epistemological perspective that you have when you're doing a study is that there is someone being studied and there is someone doing the studying. Right, and so in this sense now of the testimonios, we are kind of shifting and shaking up this idea of what it means to be an interlocutor, right? What it means to kind of be a person that tries to translate someone's experience into a way that academics and other, uh, other people in different fields can understand it, right? And now we're just trying to create more of a community conversation where people are allowed to tell their stories in a more organic fashion and develop tools and practices from there that can better assist the population. And, and right now we're still, I guess, kind of in the middle stages of this. We haven't yet started to take our, our testimonials, but it is a model that we are hoping to develop more over the course of next year. And we also already have interest from other institutions that want us to do similar projects there as well. So I think that there is a, a future beyond just our, our two year time period here, which is, which is really great and we're excited about it. Thank you, Victoria. Um, well, first, please do this research <laughs> because uh, you need it, we need it. And, and, and what you did in our in our meetings, uh, one on one with the whole group with your students, it really well personally it really impacted me. And I'm wondering what was the impact of the, uh, of the first project first, um, if you have seen any consequences after that project place. And um, I see that you 
are doing some are, are establishing some relationships between the first and the second. Um, so um, I'm wondering also if because you said that other institutions are interested in this, uh, is there behind this any kind of activism that you like beyond the classroom? I think it's something that I think about a lot and that I struggle with. Like, what's going to happen, or what do you expect? I'm not sure how I answer this question. So one of the things, okay, ultimately I think that what bridges these two projects together and what I'm seeing more and more is just the need to, A, uh, provide spaces where people can have conversations about gender and the way in which gender discrimination has impacted them, and then B, create sort of tools to teach about this, to build upon this, um, to provide people resources on how to navigate this. This is something that we are that we are lacking, and so I guess the sh the very short answer is yes, there is activism behind this because I think it is part of a much greater need than maybe we even realize. And to kind of approach this from the perspective of you know, I want to be an advocate for those people that don't have resources, for people that are not being heard, and to use my platform uh, as a way to do that, I think is, is definitely activism. Thank you. All right, um, so, well, before I start, um, uh, you see here? Yes. That was the original title. Um, but then I realized that I was not going to write this book in Spanish because if I did so, my group would not be able to help me. <laughs> and, <laughs> so, the title now has, and also the title has evolved into, I think it shows more what I'm doing. Uh, the new title is Creating a Conscious Culture, Feminism and Affect in Contemporary Spanish Music. And I, I want to, concentrate on the idea of a conscious culture in the sense of conscious, like aware of the problems, of the issues that there are uh, with uh, a cultural patriarchy, which whatever people, that nobody can convince me that we are not living uh, a cultural patriarchy, not in Spain, not in the United States, not here. So, um, and, and well, in the relationship with affect. Um, this, uh, this started because, well, for personal experiences and things that were like, I think like most of us, right? Like it, it's, it's something itches, I guess. I don't know if that's how you would say. But um, something specifically in the classroom was bothering me and it's uh, the fact that a lot of people were, including women, not uh, identifying with feminism. And I don't know if you've heard this, but I've heard this a lot also between my friends, girlfriends in Spanish telling me, you know, I'm neither machista, like a male chauvinist, I'm neither machista nor feminista. I believe in equality. You know, and, and I'm like, but do you know what this is? So I feel that I have to work a lot on this in the classroom and also uh, for me, <laughs> and, and that's why I'm doing this, and why music? Um, as Tara said earlier, Tara said, I'm quoting her, representation matters so much. Oh my God, I cannot say it. So much and it has such an impact. And that is exactly why, right? So, um, so I'm, I'm wondering, and these are the questions you can see over there. Um, I'm wondering how is culture, and in particular, uh, popular culture, and more in particular, uh, music, how is that affecting um, our lives? How is that perpetuating the patriarchal values? Um, and, well, that's everything I'm writing about now, at the moment. So, I'm thinking one way is like our vision of romantic love, right? Uh, think about all the songs and think about the poetry that you've been reading. It's, you know, uh, it, like it's all about toxic love, it's about, um, our, you know, um, the woman who has to carpet at the end <laughs> and be beautiful and be because then she's going to get all and not attractive to the male poet and etc, etc. 
So, um, and then and we keep buying it, and I watch shows on television, and I sing to songs that I really like and enjoy, but I'm thinking, oh man, I should not be liking this. <laughs> but I do, and so uh, that, those are the things that I am uh, trying to investigate. And, more, and now, also, what I want to see, I want you to visualize, and then I realize that there is so much also, how uh, there is a lot of music that contributes to the opposite. So there is a lot of feminist music. And, um, and I discovered this a lot with, you know, asking my students and like music in English, but I'm working in music in Spanish. And, and, they, and also how there is not a specific music genre, musical genre, that will be more uh, uh, chauvinist than another one. They all are equally bad and good, and or, right? Um, so basically, what I worked in these two years, I, I managed to do a lot of stuff, I think. <laughs> Thank you to everybody. Oh, and before I forget, to my student, Grace Crazy Bart, because without her over there, uh, the musical um, analysis, I do the lyrics, I do all the context, and a lot, a lot of things, but without her work on the musical analysis, this would not be worth what I think it's going to be worth. I don't know. We'll see. Uh, but I think that her work is super valuable, and I'm going to cry when she graduates. Um, so what I managed to do was the book introduction. Uh, then I also wrote um, a proposal for uh, for a publisher. Um, I wrote a little bit uh, of another chapter, and I prepared a conference. So I think I did quite a little bit. And what is the what I have to do? The rest of the book. It's a lot. <laughs> Uh, but I but I know that it was very important because from the, at the beginning I didn't know what to do. I don't know if you guys remember that. Uh, I was like, I don't know, I don't know what I'm gonna do. And now it's like, okay, this is taking shape. So we Thank you so much for sharing your work with us. It is important and timely, and it's interesting to me how. It's most, your work is mostly centered in Spain, but it connects to so many women's experiences worldwide. Um, you shared how music has uh, changed paradigms, it's given people a voice, it's united people, and so I'm wondering how working on this project has changed you. I'm not finished <laughs> with the project. <laughs> Ah, I don't know. Has it changed me anything? I don't know. I, I guess that I want to say that I'm more self-assured, but mm, I don't know. Uh, not to, uh, more than two years ago, yes. Uh, I, I think I am as assertive as I was. I am a little bit less scared, probably. Don't laugh. <laughs> <laughs> what do you think? I don't know. I, I, I think that I still have a long way to go. But okay, one of the chapters is about anger, and you, you, because you can hear my voice and all these things, you know that that is helping me work through um, perceptions and everything, and, and I don't know, maybe make me feel less self-conscious, and hopefully also teach what I'm teaching this, uh, like you know. Yes, we're loud. A lot of us are very loud, but that doesn't mean we're angry, even when we're discussing things. Hi, everyone. I'm Dawn Ensel. I'm the library director. And um, now we are we'd be thrilled to open uh, it up to the crowd for your questions to these researchers. And if none are coming right, do you have one? No. Oh, you look like you did. <laughs> Sorry. Oh. Yeah, um, thanks for your great work. Um, and we've only heard half of it so far. Um, so my question is, as I listen to the four of you, is how do we as uh, colleagues here make Salve a more merciful place when it comes to women and gender? I mean, I guess my first response that comes to me is hear our stories. 
um, when I think of especially of, of the work of the four of us, and I know you'll hear three more, but I think it's so, if I can, if I can kind of use even the, the theater in Strindberg lens here, to assume that everyone has like the same experience and to write students off as like, well, this must be the way everyone thinks or acts because it's my lens then we have ignored the stories coming in the room. Um, we've ignored trauma that comes in the room, and we can't meet students where they are, and I think gender is a, is a major part of, of who we all are. And I think even as colleagues and professors, being able to open up that conversation in class around gender that allows students to speak into it helps students as well start thinking about how I, how, how they are uh, approaching the work that they're receiving from a, from a gendered lens as well. And so I think, it, when I think of mercy sitting where all of us are, I, I think starts by hearing where all of us are. Hi everyone. I loved hearing what you all had to uh, share about your research. So I'm curious uh, what from your research has taught you about how you approach teaching differently after what you've discovered and how does it help you uh, support and interact with your students differently in the classroom? Hi, Emily. Hi. <laughs> um, that is a very good question. I think that there, it's one of the things that I experienced in sort of my hesitance to do a project like the one that I'm doing now with Testimonios was openly discussing and acknowledging the limitations of being a woman of color, a queer woman of color, right? Like there's things that have been stacked against me and it, openly acknowledging that is really difficult especially trying to also be in an authoritative position. So one of the things, just to, I guess, tag on to what Tara was talking about a little bit, is this idea of being open to talking about that in the classroom, being open to also hear, you know, about the positionality that others experience and the challenges that they've had. I think that there's, there's a lot of discourse that we have about you know, there are a lot of women on this campus, powerful, strong women, and all of that is so, so important. But then it also is important to realize, like, hey, like, there are pieces of the puzzle that we're missing here in terms of our education about ourselves, our bodies, which we're going to talk a little bit about later, like, about, you know, what it is like to be women, different kinds of women, and I'm going to use women with the, the X definition in there, um, and that talking about the limitations is a good opportunity for us to even think about where do we kind of combat that. And so I've changed the types of things that I teach about, right? I'm more open to teaching a bigger, I mean, I was before, but I, I just feel like I've learned a bigger spectrum of what gender and sexuality uh, and relationships, and even to a certain extent, you know, thinking about the, the biological nature of all of this, I've, I've thought so much more comprehensively about that, and it's changed what I teach and how I teach it as a result, if, if that makes sense. And maybe a little bit different from your answer. Um, so I've always been teaching this kind of thing, like marginalized figures. I have always been for the perspective of the immigrant, the, the queer, etc., uh, etc., etc., et and I got a lot of pushback for this. I so like really bad experiences. Uh, so <laughs> what I learned is that now I say it in the first day of class, uh, and what do I say? I say uh, very openly that I have an agenda, and that every professor has an agenda. It's just that my agenda is not the one that they're used to. They're so not used to it that they think that it's the wrong one. So I am very, very upfront, and I don't know if uh, my, any student here remembers that, but I have said it in class and I repeat it. And I'm not angry, I'm passionate. <laughs> <laughs> it's time for another question. 
Can you guys summarize what you've learned in one sentence? <laughs> you grew up. <laughs> one, one word for me, for my people, support. A lot of support. Sisterhood. I'm going to put lots of commas and semicolons in. Um, so much of what this Stringer experiment became started from conversations with people, and I know that it everybody has something in it as a result. So I learn, once again, theater only works if it's in full collaboration and dialogue. One percent? One percent. <laughs> Uh, research is not a dirty word. I think that one of the things that I, uh, this, oh, that's more than one second. Well, anyway, one of the things that I learned in grad school was that it was, if you were doing research, that it would be bias, right? If you were doing it on your own community, your own uh, culture. But white men have been doing research on white people forever, and that was never thought of as bias. So research is definitely not a dirty word. <laughs> Thank you, and now I'm privileged to introduce our next set of speakers. I'll hand this over to you. Um, we will hear from Dr. Harrington Luker first, um, who is a professor in the Department of English, Communications, and Media, and the Program Coordinator of Women, Gender, and Sexuality Studies on her um, Macaulay Teaching and Research Initiative. Life Writing, Women and Autobiography. And then uh, we will hear from Dr. Kathleen Muirhead, the assist an assistant professor in counseling, leadership, and expressive arts, who will then offer a brief response to Donna's work and share out on her own teaching and research initiative, examining human development through the, a non-binary gender lens. And finally, we will hear from Dr. Belinda Barbagallo, Associate Professor in the Department of Biology and Biomedical Sciences, who will present her project on the risks of PFOS exposure in pregnancy, a public health outreach campaign, with Donna harrington Luca responding. And then we'll conclude with a bit more time for questions and conversation with all of us. And please join me now in welcoming Dr. Donna harrington Luca in our next installment. Okay, great. Thank you all for being here. Um, a little bit of background. Um, I teach both on the literature and communication side in the English department. But for the last 10 years, uh, or maybe even just a little bit more, my scholarly work really has focused on print culture or what's called the history of the book. Um, and basically what that means is that I'm absolutely fascinated by anything having to do with publishers, um, authors, and especially reading reception and reading communities. So this project on women's life writing, um, it was just a natural outgrowth of interest that I already had. And this was a wonderful opportunity. I don't know as if I would have pursued them if I hadn't had this opportunity. Uh, it also dovetails very, very nicely with my interest in uh, women, gender, and sexuality studies. So uh, let me outline a, a little bit of my, yeah, it's up there my project here. Uh, it, and can I just say at the outset, it was great fun. Um, it was professionally challenging, uh, and I would love to do it again. Uh, the first year of the project, I might not have felt quite that way. Uh, the first year of the project was um, uh, overwhelming, and I think my student researcher, uh, Hannah, stand up, wave. Um, <laughs> Hannah Muehlberger. Uh, Hannah was my research assistant for this. Hannah is an English literature manager and a minor in women, gender, and sexuality studies. She's a senior, and this project was part of her Pell experiential learning. Um, this was an absolute gift. I have not had the opportunity really to work in this way with a student before, um, and uh, Hannah was uh, such a resource, um, and I'm grateful for that. Now, about the challenge part of it. Hannah and I found out really, really quickly that there were an overwhelming number of possible texts that we could include. This shouldn't have come as a surprise to me. 
Autobiography is one of the most popular genres in the literary marketplace, and it has been that way since the 19th century. So between us, we soon had, honestly, I think it's the most massive Google document ever created um, of titles of possible works to look at. And the titles ranged from uh, captivity narratives from the colonial period to contemporary political bestsellers like uh, Michelle Obama's Becoming. Uh, beyond that, that wasn't enough, okay? Beyond that, it soon came to the fore for both of us that we couldn't limit it to autobiography, that we had to open it up to the definition of memoir. We needed to open it up to letters and journals, those so-called private writings in which women became to identify themselves. And I'm gonna use, I love your woman X, okay? So just hear that, please, when I say woman. Uh, so, um, overwhelmed by all this, uh, our questions came to coalesce around uh, these uh, questions that you see up here. Um, number one, um, especially, um, what are the ways in which women write themselves from the margins into the mainstream? Uh, and I was especially concerned, and Hannah was as well, voices of women of color um, and voices of women who identify as queer. Um, the second uh, question, the importance of identity. Um, we were thinking of these texts, of course, as an exercise in identity formation, um, but we were also really, really aware that the students who would be reading this, um, and these were primarily sophomores and juniors, that the exercise of reading was very much going to be identity formation um, as well. And then finally, the third one, um, uh, my major research interest. How in the world did these texts operate in what is essentially a commercially driven system? Uh, so that look at the literary marketplace and the relationship there was important to me. So we organized this and, oh, an absolutely Herculean effort. Um, we narrowed it down to four major texts, texts that would ground it. And then we surrounded those by, with a number of other texts to make the most of it. And you can see the four here, um, up there in the left hand, um, your left hand column. Uh, we started with uh, Vera Britton's Testament of Youth. This is a World War I memoir, a young woman who goes to Oxford, who leaves Oxford at the outbreak of the war to become a volunteer nurse. Um, it is a story of tragedy. She loses her fiance, she loses her brother, she loses two of her most important male friends in World War I. World War I has typically been positioned and framed um, as male loss. So this is a very heart-rending um, uh, and informative look at what it meant to women. Uh, we also took a look at Angela Davis. These were ones that we read nearly in full. Angela Davis's autobiography. Uh, and I came to that, quite frankly, because I was absolutely intrigued by the idea uh, that this is an autobiography that was commissioned uh, and edited uh, by, the, uh, by Toni Morrison, uh, the great American novelist. Uh, a, for, a third one was The Secret Diaries of Anne Lister. If there are any Gentleman George fans in the room, if you've been following that story. Um, Anne Lister, 19th century British wealthy landowner uh, who kept voluminous diaries. Uh, and she wrote a book, many of the diaries, in what was called cryptan, that is, a code. Uh, and the code it was broken in the last 20 or 30 years. Uh, and what was written there was her life as a les identifying as a lesbian. Uh, and uh, so we took a look at that. And then finally we ended with Educated, a very contemporary uh, trauma memoir, a terror Westover, a bestseller with a number of ethical implications to it. So those became the core of the course that we offered as a PEL seminar. And I'm really um, very thankful for that opportunity in 2023. Um, we'd still tweak it. Um, I think it was a success, but as with any course, the first time you teach it, you tweak. Um, and in terms of what next, I think for both of us, and I don't want to speak for Hannah, but I will, um, uh, uh, what next? Uh, Hannah's off to graduate school, um, and um, let me just say she is still considering possibilities, but one of them is a master's that will combine literature and women and gender studies. Just put that out there, I'm not voting. Um, uh, um, as for me, I've been thinking more and more of this. The last major book on 
memoir in the marketplace was in 2013. It's a book called Boom. It's about popular marketplace and memoir. Uh, but 2013, that's before Book Talk, that's before Bookstagram, that's before celebrity book clubs, um, and that's before the book bans that we're currently undergoing. So I'm really intrigued by this idea of contemporary women's memoirs because I think something uh, really quite radical um, is, is occurring in the marketplace. I'm interested in the reading communities that are supporting uh, these books. I'm interested in the literary marketplace and the way in which these figure as both a commercial and a capitalistic. So that's my summer. I'll stop there. <laughs> Thank you so much, Donna. And something that always stuck out to me in our conversations around your project was how we even conceptualize a story. Like written books seem to be the default, but in what ways our oral history is a, a big part of our, our story as uh, women in, in marginalized gender communities. Um, I'm curious, because any any time you presented, I had like a rolling list of like, I was like, I need this book and that book. I'm also a part of Bookstagram and Book Talk, so maybe I'm part of the problem. But I'm curious if you had like a place to start. Like, what if if everyone could go out and get get a book and and start somewhere with these narratives? And maybe I'm asking a really tough question, but where would you start? How to say Babylon? Um, uh, Google it now. Um, if you need to start someplace, it's very contemporary. It's receiving a lot of critical attention and commercial attention. It has been nominated, it's, it's won a bazillion awards. Um, uh, it is about a young woman who grows up in a Rastafarian household um, and uh, uh, eventually rejects that um, with, with great difficulty. And so the family dynamics. It's received a lot of critical attention and it's just been nominated. Um, they now have a women's prize for nonfiction because there hadn't been a women's prize for nonfiction. So it's the first ever and it is nominated there as well. Um, and I think it's that great combination. It is beautifully written. Um, absolute, um, you know, the aesthetics are so very, very strong. The storytelling is so very, very strong. The way it will ask you to question your relationship to family, I think, is is inevitable, um, and it's just gotten such good buzz. So yeah, Google now, Amazon, wherever, local bookstore. Yeah. Library. 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 Yeah. Um, also, if anyone's on Goodreads, you got to put it on the Goodreads too. I'm going to be doing that. Um, hello everyone, my name is Katie and I teach in our master's counseling program. I'm also a licensed mental health counselor in the state of Rhode Island. Um, and my profession, uh, among many, many other things, is centered around helping people sit in a room with someone else and hold space for their experience. How do you show up in a way where you get out of the way of the emotional process and let someone exist? Um, and because that's my purpose in life and, and everything that I'm so passionate about, um, many of the things that we talk about in our program is what do we need to do in order to show up in that way? And there's different dimensions. There's building awareness, there's building knowledge, there's skills, and there's also action or advocacy. So the only reason we're building knowledge or awareness is to be able to act, to do something. Um, so, my uh, project was centered around one class that I build to help our students do that. To show up in spaces where um, you can understand the human experience, hold space for the, the complexity of the human experience, um, and be a professional helper. I want to start by letting you know that my project is founded, or, or not founded, grounded in what's called queer theory. And there's, it is a fascinating theory. I highly recommend you check it out. Um, but one of the founding tenets of queer theory is that every time you try to create a category, someone exists outside of your category. And therefore, your category is not very good. Um, and even by me saying that, I'm creating a category, which someone will never, do you see? It, it goes on and on. Um, so uh, what I wanted to do is match the reality of the counseling room, which I am very much a part of, with academe. What do we say in textbooks? And in this particular class called Human Growth and Development, we would read textbooks that would say, boys do this and girls do that. 
and men do this, and women do that. And at this age, this is what happens, and at that age, this is what happens. And that's all very black and white, cut and dry, like just love categories, we love it, and also terribly not realistic. I will, <laughs> microphone. Um, it's not realistic. The way that my clients are showing up is not the way that the textbook is teaching my students how clients are showing up. That helps no one. So the question was, how do we teach human growth and development from a gender expansive lens? How can I tell you information about how people learn and grow without trying to force a gender binary that not everybody aligns with? Um, oh, this microphone's gonna test me. <laughs> I, my impulse is to just start projecting, but I'm scared. <laughs> okay. That's all right. I mean, I can just start yelling. All right, so I'm gonna yell. Oh, okay, I'm not gonna yell. <laughs> I'm gonna stop yelling. Um, so, so, the question was, how do we teach people about how humans learn and grow in a way that represents the diversity of human life? And I looked at a lot of textbooks, and they were not as helpful as I thought they might be. So uh, I took this opportunity, um, which I was so grateful to, to be able to be a part of, to create a course where we talk about human growth and development from a gender expansive lens. I want to highlight for just a moment, you'll notice there's two pieces of artwork on my slide. These artworks are from queer authors, uh, or not authors, queer artists. I've also put their Instagram handles. I believe that part of activism is elevating voices with whatever power you have. This is me doing that. Go check out their Instagram if you want to. Also, I believe in giving you a next step. What do you do after you hear me say what I learned from this? And many of the works that I used to inform my class and my approach are included in that QR code. If you wanna know where to go next, if you wanna know what book to read, what one to put on your Goodreads, your written list or wherever, there's a, a basically a Google document which will give you a list of those works. Um, but from my own exploration, what I ended up learning is that uh, the gender human experience is way more expansive than even I uh, contended with. Um, and, and it helped me to explore what gender means to me within the context, context of culture. It also helped me to learn how to be connected to a community that has been here and existed since the dawn of time. Um, that, that the voices of folks who identify as non-binary, gender expansive, transgender, have always been here, have always been talking and writing about their experience. Um, and, and we need to be uh, accurate uh, evidence-based purveyors of that truth, regardless of our cultural, uh, you know, predispositions or assumptions. Um, as I was doing that, I discovered that you can't really do a gender expansive lens, a gender expansive lens, without incorporating other lenses like a sex-positive lens, uh, a body liberation lens, a fat acceptance lens, as a local fat professor, this was very important to me, um, and an age positive lens. How do we look at the ways humans develop, not as normal and abnormal? Is this like wiggling in and out? Okay. Uh, can I just yell? Okay. Um, so we were really working on not only do we, how do we have a gender expansive lens, but what other lenses are related to this gender expansive way of looking at the human experience. That way, any student who comes into my room, their experience is represented as a human. And additionally, when my students go out as licensed counselors to help folks, that they are prepared to step into a room, and if their client says, I identify as non-binary, they are prepared to know what that means, to know what resources to provide, all of that good stuff. And all of that had led me to, uh, there needs to be a textbook on this. Uh, I really 
I, I love, you know, scanning, photocopying, you know, putting resources together, but, I really don't, but um, if I could just have a book that did this, I would love that. So, my next steps are to create a human growth and development textbook for counselors that uses a gender expansive lens, that uses a sex positive lens and a positive aging lens. That way, when I teach my class, I don't have to play in caveats. I don't have to go, well, be aware, watch out, ooh. I can just teach from a book that aligns with what, what science and uh, history and anthropology have always known are true. Um, and so, I invite you, as a way to step forward and move forward from this moment, to check out some of these resources, or maybe you check them out and they're not for you, find ones that work for you, um, and, and to start questioning what experience, what human experience exists that I am not attending to, that I don't understand, and where is my opportunity for growth, rather than expecting someone to conform to my, to my boxes. And I'm sorry for being young. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I don't know if you know this about Katie, but you always leave a conversation with her a book list and it's never disappointing. So definitely <laughs> go by that. Um, so other than coming to your workshop at the Mercy Summit next week, <laughs> um, what's one thing we could all do tomorrow walking into the classroom to make it more welcoming environment for our students who don't identify a lot this uh, social construct of gender? <laughs> yeah, that's a great question. So, so we in the counseling program think of, um, it, and this is something that comes out of disability activism, the idea of accessibility. Who has access to you? Who has access to the things you're teaching and who doesn't? Um, and, and I'm being very realistic about this. There are lots of folks who have access to the way I teach, but there are lots of folks that don't. Um, and, and I'm working all the time to find ways to increase accessibility. So whenever you're in a space, whether you're teaching, whether you're talking to a friend, um, always ask yourself, who has access to me and who doesn't? Um, and is there something I can be doing about that? And one thing that um, always helped, or, or has really helped me in showing that my space is accessible to gender expansive um, uh, you know, content and questions, is to do what I like to call preempting. Uh, and on the first day of class, I let folks know, if you'd like to share your pronouns with us, you can. I share my pronouns with my students fairly frequently. Um, I let students know that pronouns can change. I let students know that we're going to be talking about uh, human growth and development from these lenses. Um, and I think by starting the conversation that way, by, by letting folks know that I'm open to it, they don't have to wait to like, be like, oh, I hope she takes this okay. Like, they they come in, the first, some of the first words they hear out of my mouth are, here are the lenses that I use. Here are the ways that you are welcome into the space. Um, and then, listen. Um, and, and I know that sounds so corny, um, but human beings are not taught in the social sphere to be very good listeners. Um, we are taught to hear to respond. Have you ever been in a conversation, someone's talking and you're already thinking, okay, I have a story for this. Go, 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 go. And they're like, you're like, okay, okay, okay. And um, we as counselors work to make sure that when we are listening, I'm listening to hear your experience, to understand your experience, and to give you space to be you, to be a person in my presence. And that is some of the best things that we can do. Open up a conversation, and give folks space and believe them. If someone tells you they have an experience or an identity, believe them. It's not our job to police someone's identity, to police the things that matter to folks. So I highly recommend, also, I recommend every human being like take a counseling class at some point. Um, <laughs> but uh, I recommend learning how to be a human being who shows up for others.
Yeah, yeah, yeah. Can you hear me through yes. Oh, I guess I'll use the mic. to share some of the research that I was personally doing in the research lab. I am um, a neuroscientist, I pretend to be a toxicologist, and most of my work was around what happens when mom gets exposed to all of these environmental chemicals and then decides to have children. And uh, we started this project last year, and as we started digging into communication about women's health, we realized what a minefield this was. How women were either not getting any information about their health, about sexual health, about pregnancy, menopause, any of these big things. Um, and a lot of the times we're getting incorrect help. If anyone has ever opened TikTok, you know that any random person with a phone can tell you anything they want and most of them have no credentials for that. And in a time when women's reproductive rights and women's health are under attack, not just under study, but under attack, I found it incredibly important to work towards educating, especially our young women here at Salve, um, and doing so with facts and figures. So this project started out as a social media campaign. Um, the lovely Sam is over here. Sam is my um, research assistant on this project. She is absolutely brilliant with all things um, social media, social media marketing. So if you have any questions, ask her, not me. Um, and so if you want to follow our Instagram, you can use this QR code here. And Sam has been posting a lot of information about women's health, um, book lists and playlists and all sorts of other um, fun facts. All of it backed up with science. You can find your references and sources for everything she posts right in the Instagram. And so this was the beginning of the project, and if you haven't noticed the theme of all these projects snowballing, um, you put all of us in a room and the ideas fly, and you can't just stick with your original plan. Um, so this expanded into um, more of a mission to educate women about themselves and their bodies. And the next phase of this project actually ended up being very collaborative with other members of the group. So both Katie's came into my um, hormones and behavior course and talked about um, gender and reproductive um, psychology for our students. And it was incredible to get this different um, outside perspective. I had uh, my sister who happens to be a nurse practitioner come in and talk about birth control and reproductive medicine. Um, I am collaborating with Tara and Mark from theater, um, and if you ever thought bio and theater, that's a weird mashup, um, to work with their devising students to put together a piece about um, women's health and challenges in women communicating, um, especially with clinicians who don't believe them a lot of the time or don't have the correct information. Um, so, and that one's uh, May 8th at 4 p.m. in the Black Box Theater, if you want to come and check that out. Um, and so going forward with this part of the project, what we are trying to do now is we are trying to put together an interdisciplinary course on um, women's health and sexuality as a way to serve our students who don't know very basic things like, um, what is a menstrual cycle? What is my anatomy? How is, what is gender, right? You know, biology, there's no binary gender in biology, but most people don't know that or know enough to be able to communicate that. So we talk about a lot of that stuff in my um, behavioral endocrinology course, but you know, that's 28 students every other year. So we want to expand that. Um, and then the third part of this project has been to really expand this. Um, teaching in biology, I have a lot of future clinicians, future researchers, um, and I feel like it's my job to teach them how to do this type of communication. Scientists are historically bad at communicating with non-scientists. Uh, remember that pesky pandemic thing where nobody knew what was going on? Um, so if that didn't highlight our need to properly train our students in scientific communication, I don't know what would. So what we've been, I've been doing is I've been putting together a, a pedagogical project that teaches students 
how to distill this very complicated information into useful um, little bite-sized pieces, blog posts, infographics for non-scientists without either being condescending, which you know we've all been to a doctor's office and, and felt that condescension with explanation, um, but is also very informative and very accessible. Again, with all of their references, all of their facts being double-checked. This project I'm currently running in my um, Bio 284 class where students are split up into groups and we are doing some assessment for engagement and content learning with the hopes of um, being able to publish a workshop practice. I know that a lot of barriers for faculty to try new innovative things is we're just all overloaded all of the time. Um, so I'm hoping that by putting together this package that I could you know, publish online, publish with a journal, and say, here it is, just plug your, you know, your topics into it, um, would help to spread this kind of education beyond just um, my students here at Salve. Okay, so it's probably not lost on you that the literature person is going to be responding to a neuroscientist. Um, and I want to suggest to you that I think this was one of the oh, amazing strengths of the collaborative. Um, it was truly interdisciplinary. Um, and so from the literature person then, um, uh, I think uh, hearing your work, I, when you started out, um, this was kind of maybe a, a, a personal experience. Um, I had not heard of PFOS, um, so an awareness at that level. Belinda had us watch the single most terrifying John Oliver video, um, uh, once again, Google it, um, uh, about PFAS. It's just absolutely brilliant. And it really brought home, this was something that I needed to pay more attention to. But I think as well, just intrigued of your project in terms of an exercise in communication, um, of getting public health, good public health information out there. Um, and it's also an exercise in storytelling, uh, which is what um, I am typically involved in. Um, and I think I found that kind of this application that you used um, has the potential to be applied to so many other public health issues. Um, but a question maybe from your students. Do they tell you why is it that it's so difficult to communicate public health information? I think a big part of the reason why it's difficult to relay this kind of health information is that oftentimes science is like another language, right? We have all these words that mean very different things, even words that are common in the English language that mean very different specific things in science. And as you move through, um, just like most other fields, you drill so deeply into one little aspect of what you're studying that we forget how to communicate with people who are not on our level in our field, right? We get so used to writing these high-level research papers <clears throat> for the scientific community that, frankly, you know, 20 people are gonna read. Um, and we forget that we're not doing it because it's fun to putz around in the lab. We're doing it because it's better in humanity. We're doing it to um, help, especially for us, help women make better choices, have more educated um, decision-making. So I think that it helps my students to really dig deep and know that they really understand the topic so that they can then translate it into a way that makes sense to non-scientists. You have to know something really extremely well on top of building the skill set of communication in order to convey this information because it's incredibly complicated and incredibly nuanced. And as I say to my students, at least once a week, biology is messy. So I can't just give you a clear black and white. So there's a lot of nuance there that when lost, the real meaning is lost. So complexity, I would say. Thank you. And now we, um, we're on to the portion of the program where we get to hear your questions for the panel. Thank you to all of the presenters today. It's been so informative. Um, one of the things that has come out of your um, presentation, Belinda, that I'm super curious about is this collaboration with um, the theater department. And I can imagine 
as a result of this collaboration, how a conversation could have taken place with all of the people here and how ideas could have flowed and, and minds already open to thinking about collaborations taking place. But I'm also remembering um, what I would consider uh, an interdisciplinary co uh, collaboration that has been at Salve between the biology, philosophy, and religion departments where faculty have brought you know, folks in the classroom to kind of give students a richer uh, perspective. So I, I see those as very similar. And I'm just curious, how do these conversations outside of a wonderful initiative like this, how could a conversation like that begin? Because I think you also stated how you're all in your own disciplines, very immersed in that. And so how do you sort of step out and um, bring others into a more uh, general understanding of what you're doing so that they could find a place for themselves how they could fit in and help. I hope that yeah. makes sense. Thank you. So that, so that collaboration with philosophy and religion is also something um, that I put together with Pete Colosi um, on the topic of neuroscience versus the soul. Um, and I think that you know some of it, I chalk it down to uh, those intangible things you learn in college. Um, my sorority girl skills have uh, done me well. I just talk to people, honestly. Um, new people who come in, um, I shoot them an email. I, I bugged Katie just this morning and said, hey, let's grab a coffee, let's chat. Um, I think that part of the beauty of being in a place like Salve where everybody has their little specialties is that we can talk to each other, we can have conversations, and these things come up organically. It doesn't have to be like a chore or something you really have to like, okay, here's my list. Um, just taking the time to talk to people more, get to know people on campus more, um, and all of these things come up really organically, and they turn into these really wonderful experiences for students. Um, and I know my students absolutely love having Katie and Katie come in guest lecture, and they got to see things from a very different perspective. Um, Katie Merhead used some language that like, their eyes were like saucers. They had no idea what was coming for them, and I think it was really good. I think it's a really good way to um, expand the way you think about things, and I felt the same way um, working with the theater students. Like, if you want a super fun, enthusiastic group of students to work with, go to the theater department, um, because they're wonderful, and it helps us to think about things in a different way. I, I guess I have a comment to make that sort of sitting from here and as a scientist, I'm not typically changed by my research, right? It's very sort of data generating and you know, you publish the thing, but it is not emotionally impacting me. So I think it's, I don't know, it's so remarkable to see that your work is personal and is transformative. I just think that's very refreshing from a scientist perspective. Um, well, but Linda, you said something about biology is messy, and I think that's part of the difficulty with science communication because I might tell you something that's true today, but we only understand kind of six percent of the thing. So tomorrow I might tell you a little something different, but it's not because the early information is fake or false, right? And so I think that's part of the thing that we need public trust to some degree, and that's. Um, I think if, if this might get people's minds moving, I have a little question too. Um, related to storytelling and, and also me search, and also sort of the intersection of like the scientific method with this idea of me search and, and also storytelling. Like they, they seem like, it seems like this is sort of a, a huge 
seismic shift in how we think about scholarly research. And I, I guess I hadn't entirely formed my question before I started speaking, but I wonder if it might spur some of you to like have some comments. It seems like you do. So this is, um, this is something that came up across all of our presentations, I feel like, is methodology. Like, how do we understand knowledge, what it is, the way it's built? Um, and something that I think is so important to recognize is the intersection of quantitative research, which is your research method, you know, hypothesis, didactic, you know, like there's there's sort of that, that trajectory, um, but a very robust existing qualitative research line, which says that instead of trying to isolate the complexity of life, instead of trying to get rid of all of these confounding variables where it's like, we distill this down to the perfect thing and now we can study it for it, like these parts. Um, it's, it's a recognition that the experience of life is nuanced, it is contextual, it is, um, it, if you believe in the idea that there isn't a capital T truth for every person, that truth is going to shift based on who's involved and in what ways, um, qualitative research does such a lovely job of being like, that's a part of it. Like, the context, the emotion, the people, the government, the every part of that is a part of how we show up. And what I think is so exciting is the opportunity to mix quantitative research, which does that scientific method, with qualitative research. Um, my dissertation was a mixed methods research study, and that's my favorite, because instead of, you know, I get to, I get to collect quantitative data, but then I get to ask for more nuance out of my data that really um, you need both in order to have that full meaning. So in some ways, and this comes from a person who's on the IRB committee as well, um, in some ways I think it's about expanding the way we see knowledge, the way we approach it, and the questions we ask, and to recognize that it's okay to ask complex questions in a complex world, um, that that all is part of how we understand our our phenomenon around us. Well, that sounds like a really great way. It's almost a mic drop right there. So thank you so much. Um, and thank you all for coming to this great um, presentation. Um, I found it really inspiring and I'm I can tell that a lot of people in the audience did as well. Um, please continue this conversation with treats over here. Um, and um, we look forward to seeing where all of this research continues and goes and what it brings to our students as well. So thank you. Thank you all so much.